Hi there. My name is Cindy Atias. Welcome to Appreciative Cooking. This is the first session in our winter wellness series. I'm Cindy Atias, a certified health coach, a personal chef, a restaurant menu consultant, and your host for today's program. I want to thank the Jewish Federation of Cleveland for providing this opportunity for our community. We have more than 300 individuals on this section. I would like to recognize Jewish Federation of Cleveland board chair, David Heller, and Federation president, president Erica Rudin Luria for their leadership during this unprecedented time. You have both navigated these uncharted waters with tremendous skill. We are excited for today's launch of this new series, which is designed to enhance your mind, your body, and your spirit. Our aim is to provide ideas, tools, and resources to promote overall wellness and individual resilience. We also hope to strengthen your connection to others during this isolating time by doing this in community and as a community. I have a feeling you are joining us today because you already appreciate the ways in which cooking and food contribute to our wellness, or because you are a big fan of today's headliner. Yes, there is the primary function of food, calories to keep our bodies functioning, but that's not what today is all about. Today is about that extra something that elevates our meal. Today is about appreciating how our food choices enhance our five senses seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and feeling. And it's about taking the time to care for yourself and your loved ones. This afternoon, our very own celebrity chef, Doug Katz, will be demonstrating how to create a meal that makes us feel good. Doug will share recipes and demonstrate how we can use cooking to promote health and wellness. How simple and fresh ingredient choices will impact your health and overall well being for the better. It's Doug attention to the unexpected details and his original pairing combinations that enhance both flavor and comfort that have made his restaurants so popular. Doug Katz was the owner and executive chef of Fire Food and Drink at Shaker Square. He is the chef partner at Provenance at Cleveland Museum of Art and the chef proprietor of several other concepts, including Chutney B at Van Aken, Chimmy and Amba on Lee Road, and Zug at Fairmount, which Mazel Tov Doug just won, a few months ago won the Esquire 20 Best New Restaurants. Doug is a huge supporter of local farmers and artisans. He is also national and international advocate for food system that is sustainable, healthful, and local. We would like to make tonight's program as interactive as possible. Do not be shy. Join the chat. Say hi to friends and feel free to ask questions. Hey, Doug, what will you be cooking for us this evening? Thank you, Cindy. <clears throat> well, really, I'm making chicken and rice, but uh, as you really want to, you know, start your wellness and your health with sort of fun and, uh, you know, enjoy the process, it's not exactly just chicken and rice. Uh, we are going to add some really great elements, flavor elements, to make it really fun and creative. Uh, but really, I think first, it's really important to get your, your sort of head in the game as to what we're doing today. So when you cook at home, you have to go into it, assuming you're going to have a great time. You can't go into it stress from your day and uh you know you you really have to have the energy and the want to cook and that will make it so much more fun so what we're going to do first is start with our chicken so if you'll head over to the stove with me uh i have a second camera here uh so we will see if hopefully that works and you can see what i'm doing and the most important thing first, so I, I'm using chicken with the bone in. I think that it is much more tender and much more delicious when you do chicken on the bone. If you don't want the skin, if you don't want the bone, cook it this way and then take the skin you know, off and then take the chicken off the bone. But I think you know, using thighs, it just adds really great moist flavor to your chicken. 
Uh, we are going to, or I am going to uh, season it with a little bit of kosher salt. If you're using a kosher chicken, be careful. Uh, you don't want to over season it with salt. Uh, I also am going to use a little bit of black pepper and a little bit of uh, paprika just to add some color. I'm heating my pan over a, a high heat and it's, I have a really heavy duty pan as well, which is really important. So first you want to heat your pan uh, and I'm going to use some gloves today just so that I can season this chicken easily. And I will season both sides and I like to sprinkle the salt sort of high up so that you get more of like a rain shower of salt. A little bit of black pepper and a little bit of paprika. And then I'm going to add our fat to our pan. And turn that over. Season the opposite side. And when the oil is ready, it sort of shimmers like a, you know, a stream. You know that it's ready when it starts to shimmer. And I'm going to take that chicken skin side down. And as Cindy mentioned, we cook with our senses. So you hear that chicken hit the pan and you hear it sizzling. If you don't hear that sizzle, you're not really cooking. And that's part of the fun. It also releases, you know, when you use paprika, uh, that, that fat will actually release the flavor from that paprika into that oil, and it'll give it a, a much better flavor uh, when it's complete. So at this point, we're just going to let that sear and we'll get a really nice golden brown color. And now I'm going to show you how to start the zucchini and I'm gonna move this camera. Hey, Don. And yes. Can you tell us about the type of oil that you're using? Yes, so I either use sunflower oil, which is a really healthy oil. I try not to use canola oil. Sunflower oil has uh, just a, a healthier oil. Um, I also use olive oil. So in this, I use sunflower. Uh, with the zucchini, I use a little bit of olive oil. Um, so that's, that's that. Um, on that. So uh, now I have our zucchini. I'm going to show you first how I slice or how I dice an onion. Uh, you want to make sure that you leave the core on your onion and then you make a couple cuts into your onion, turn it, and then make several julienne cuts through your onion. And then you can turn it again. And then you just cut across. You have to make sure you have a nice sharp knife. And because you leave the core on, it just keeps it all uniform in size. And when you're down to that end, you can just cut down the onion again and just dice the rest. And all you're left with is the core and that core can go right into your compost. And I'm just going to put this in a bowl. Hi, I've Doug. washed my zucchini. Yeah. Quick question. Going back sure. to the oil. There's two questions about the oil. One of them yes. is how much oil do you use? Like how, how do you know how much oil to use? And then there's another. So everyone will get the, the everyone like, will get the recipe tomorrow. Uh -huh. uh, so you'll have the exact, but uh, I would say about one and a half to two ounces. Great. And then um, what about heating the olive oil t at high temperatures? I missed that question. <laughs> there was a question about um, olive oil and heating it at a high temperature. So I don't like to, uh, I use pure olive oil when I'm sauteing. Extra virgin olive oil, I save for my salads and salad dressings. I try not to cook with that. Uh, it just, you're paying way too much money for that extra virgin olive oil and it's just not, it's not worth cooking with that oil. So um, I would say just use a pure oil, uh, olive oil or use sunflower oil. Great, and you, your knives were just complimented. Um, do you use a certain knife? Yes, so I use the appropriate knife for what I'm doing. This happens to be a six inch chef's knife. 
Uh, you really want to buy a knife that has the, uh, the blade should go through the handle. And it, I like this heavy sort of blade and I also sharpen them often. Uh, so you want to have a sharp knife when you're, you're dicing and chopping and doing all these different things. So we're going to check our chicken. You can see it's got a nice sear. Just like that, but I'm going to give it a little bit more time. I just want to get it really nice, nice deep sear. And in this uh, yellow pot, this is an enamelware pot. It's a really heavy duty pot. This is what I'm going to use to saute the zucchini. And I'm going to preheat that as well. Don't be afraid too with the chicken. It does release a lot of fat. So I'm just going to pour some of that fat off and it'll actually help uh, create a better sear on your chicken. And you can see that's ready to flip. So I'm going to flip that chicken just like that while our pan is heating. You can see that just really nice color. And from there, then I'm going to deglaze the pan with a little bit of white wine. That adds a great acidity to the chicken. Again, you're listening to this. You can smell the aromas of the chili. Uh, and you want to reduce that down to just a syrup. Doug, and then, if, yes. if you don't want to use wine, what's a good substitute? Uh, grape juice would be great. Uh, you could also just uh, use, you know, you, even using a little bit of fruit in with the chicken, whether it's a little bit of some apricots or some golden raisins, uh, maybe just soaked in a little bit of water. Uh, that would be great too. So now I'm just going to bring this to a simmer. And at that point, I'm going to add a little bit of thyme uh, to the pan. Uh, thyme is a great antioxidant. Um, it also, again, you're, you're cooking with your senses. So when I put that in, you're going to immediately smell that great aroma uh, from the thyme. And I'm going to just put that into my oven and I'm going to cook that for about 30 minutes. Now our pan is ready for our zucchini. And this one, I'm using olive oil, not extra virgin, just olive oil. And again, you're looking for the oil just to shimmer, just like, uh, you know, sort of a stream bed. And then I'll add my onions first. You can hear that sizzle. I'm adding salt, which pulls the moisture from those onions. Just give that a little stir. Can everyone see that? Can you see that, Cindy? Yeah, we can see it. All right. It looks great. It really looks good. Um, what kind of salt and are you using? I just use kosher salt. Um, and I like the, the grind of the kosher salt. Uh, I just use diamond crystal. Mm -hmm. This is actually uh, turmeric. And turmeric is, uh, it's a root that uh, is, it's an anti-inflammatory. It's, it's really, it adds amazing color and great flavor. Uh, to the zucchini. And in order to bloom this, uh, we actually took fresh turmeric and we uh, just peeled it and then chopped it and uh, slowly dried it out. So this is actually real uh, turmeric that we use. And I'm just sprinkling that over my onions. I'm going to add a little bit of black pepper as well. Black pepper actually will help your body absorb that turmeric. The fat also helps your body absorb that turmeric as well. And I'm just shaking that around and you can really smell the acidity from the turmeric. And we'll let that cook for another second. And next I'll just add our the zucchini. And this will just cook for about five minutes and then I will stir that around. But I want to, the onions to cook with the turmeric and really get sweet and reduce down before I stir it but I will add a little bit more salt to pull some moisture out of that zucchini. And I'm just going to turn that down to just a medium high heat there. And in the meantime, I'm going to show you, I've made some rice pilaf here to go with our meal. And really, as I said, this is chicken and rice, but we're doing it in a really fun way. Uh, this is the season for pomegranates. It's the season for citrus. So I took some basmati brown rice 
uh, and I cooked that uh, with some sauteed onion and some stock. Once that was done, I cooled it. And then I added some scallions. I added some microgreens that actually Cindy grows. They're micro lentil greens. Uh, I added pomegranate seeds, some walnuts, uh, all different uh, elements. And you can really pick the ones that you like, a little bit of lemon juice and a little bit of olive oil as well. And this can be served room temperature or hot. Uh, so it's a really nice yeah. uh, change for your typical chicken and rice. Yes. We have a question about sure. uh, no or low salt diets. So salt really can be left out of all of this. Uh, I would tell you that salt does pull moisture out of your uh, food. So there are elements of salt that, you know, really you need for the science of the cooking. But if you're on a low salt diet, I would just leave the salt out or go with less salt. Um, that's what I would say. I think using acidic foods like using lemon juice or using orange juice, um, using tomatoes, things like that, add that sort of acidity that maybe that uh, really makes it olives as well, you know, where you won't miss the salt uh, in the same way, so. So going back to the pomegranates, you know, yeah. what's nice to do this time of year is you know, once a week by, you know, I'm talking from my health coach voice, once a week, uh, buy a pomegranate, take a few minutes, peel it, put it in a dish, and use it on everything. Um, it, you can't, you really can't get enough pomegranate. Pomegranate a day keeps the doctor away. So we should really take advantage of it. And I would tell you if you've never seen, huh? What's if that? you've never seeded the pomegranate, if you just cut, if you just cut the pomegranate in half and you hold it over a bowl and pound it with a spoon, all the seeds come out. So uh, if you don't typically buy pomegranates because you're worried about how long it takes to de-seed them. Just cut it in half and hold it over a bowl. Wear something that, you know, in case you get some of the, the red juice on you, or, you know, wear something that you don't care as much about. But uh, it's really simple to de-seed a pomegranate. Yeah, those seeds can go in, they can go on, you know, on the chicken, they can go in a salad. Um, when pomegranate season isn't around, raspberries, blueberries, anything with color, try to get a little bit of color into every meal. Uh, and typically, you know, just a rule, I'm gonna show you, this is our zucchini and it's going to cook down and it's going to meld uh, with those onions and uh, that the spices. Uh, and I'll have to taste that a little bit too. But what you really should cook too with, you know, think of the, the color. So, Again, with the senses, when you're thinking of using all of your senses, using your eyes and cooking with color, you know, there are definitely diets out there where they tell you, you should eat the rainbow of colors. You should eat beets, you should eat oranges, you should, uh, you know, eat white, you know, eat mushrooms. All, all different colors will actually create a healthier diet. So uh, think of that also when you're cooking. And really anything that can make it fun for you, uh, Maybe you want to have a glass of wine while you're cooking and it allows you to sort of, you know, relax a little bit more. Uh, it won't be, you know, you won't be so anxious about getting it perfect. Doug, I've got a couple of zucchini questions for you. One, sure. if uh, you don't like zucchini, what's a good substitute? And the second question is how- I think mushroom. Oh. No, how cooked do you want this? Are you cooking the zucchini? Oh, go ahead. Is it mushy or is it still firm? So- I can show you that at the end, but I would say that it's got a nice sort of al dente texture. It's got a little bit of color. It's got a little bit of bite to it, um, but it does have a nice juiciness. So uh, it's not mushy like where you could, you know, mush it up. And I would say there are many things that would be good with this. I would say, um, let's see, I think eggplant would be great this way. Mushrooms would be great. Uh, if you like yellow squash, but not zucchini, I think that would be a great uh, dish. Uh, some of the squashes like uh, butternut squash, even the winter squashes would be great. Um, really, I think just pick the vegetables. I, I wouldn't do asparagus or, you know, Brussels sprouts, things like that, though. Um, really, you should play and have fun in the kitchen. And if it sounds good to you, you should try it. Uh, 
All right, so I think we are almost there. And I'll show you that finish too. So I have a finished one right here and you can see how it all just sort of melds with the color. And you can see there's still a nice texture and we'll garnish this with a little bit of oregano at the end as well. And I'm just gonna check the chicken, make sure that we're, so it's cooking nicely. I'm just going to take a little bit of that fat and that juice and just put it onto that skin. It will still stay crispy, but I'm just looking to baste it every once in a while. And our zucchini is almost done. The next thing that we will do is uh, I will actually plate everything up and I will show you what the finished uh, buffet or plating would look like when it's all done. But if anyone else has any questions, I'm happy to answer. Yeah, um, questions just disappeared. So let me, um, there's somebody asked a question about, oh, the vegetarian question. So. What can you yes. um, substitute for vegetarians, the chicken? I was thinking, you know, those gorgeous, you know, big portobellos or something, would that work? They would, I think too. Um, you know, I love like eggplant uh, planks or, you know, if you, uh, I even think like in the summer, if you take halves of tomatoes, those would be great. Uh, even a potato of some kind, if you just, uh want to sear the potatoes and slowly cook them those would be great I, they wouldn't be as good with the rice obviously uh, i think a fish dish would be great uh, as well it's really just a simple chicken preparation so we thought, i would just have fun with it but the ch okay go, huh? can continue the um we have oh, a no. uh, pandemic vegetable washing question are you washing your vegetables yeah. any different during the pandemic or do you always just wash them the same and wonderfully? Uh, I would tell you that um, as a chef, like I washed the zucchini, I don't wash my berries. I know people would go crazy hearing that, but I buy only organic berries. Um, I'd rather see a little bug come out of my berry and sort of uh, push it off, but I don't wash my berries because they just break down. If I'm making a berry syrup or a coulis or some sort of sauce, it's okay for me. I'd rather ingest the organic uh, berry. And I, I'm not worried about the pandemic in terms of um, those food. Uh, um, I'm not a scientist, but I would tell you that, you know, I don't think that the food itself is carrying the, uh, the virus, at least from what we understand. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm sort of cooking as normal, but I'm washing my hands a ton and I'm wearing gloves and I wear a mask when I'm, you know, around other people. And that's how I handle the pandemic, but I never wash my berries. I also would tell you mushrooms. Uh, I, I like to brush them off with a dry towel. I try not to uh, wash those either, uh, but white mushrooms, I do sometimes use a little vinegar and water and let them soak. And then I really let them dry uh, well before I would use them. I, um, so we're about ready on our zucchini. Yeah. Just uh, somebody wanted to reach out how to open the pomegranate. There's actually some really cute YouTubes yes. of, of people opening pomegranate. Uh -huh. so it's probably the easiest thing to do is just YouTube. There's some people hit a hit like a wooden spoon on top of they cut it in half and hit a wooden spoon. You can also some people, you know, peel it back. Um, when you when you open your own pomegranate at home, the seeds will last. I use the I use the spoon method. You're the method. Uh, so the and then uh, you know we will. Uh, I'll finish the the. Uh, what? No. Go. Oh, okay. Oh, I was going to tell you that I'm just I'm picking a little bit of oregano and I'm going to garnish the uh, the zucchini with the oregano, um, and I'm just going to pick a few of the leaves and I'm just going to chop those. And I'll just put those right on top. How oh, pretty. Uh, and it, again, it adds an amazing smell and flavor to it as well. Does, it, does the oregano smell different once you throw it in that pan? 
it Once does. You... I think it has a very, you know, it has an earthiness when it's when it's raw. When it when it hits the pan and it cooks a little bit, I think it gets a little bit. Uh, you know, it creates more depth that I would say maybe a little bit sweeter. It balances well with the sweetness of the onion, uh, the bitterness of the, the turmeric. The turmeric definitely gets, you know, it has a bitterness, but when it cooks and it, it blends with that sweet onion, it really balances it and uh, creates just an amazing color. And for someone who always uh, feels like I could lose a pound, uh, knowing that turmeric no. is, is a, is, yeah, turmeric is definitely an anti-inflammatory. So I tend to drink a turmeric latte every single day, just because I, whether it's for good luck or not, it makes me feel better. And I, I, uh, I definitely use turmeric as often as I can in my diet. So, so we got we have two questions. Um, sure. One I think is for both of us. The other one is somebody who tends to overcook their chicken. They don't know when it's done. Um, uh huh. But that's the beauty of using the chicken thigh. Like you, can, you almost can't overcook a chicken thigh. But try. So like people well, like it. So yeah, go I'm on. Show you. Ask you the second um, question. So this is definitely not done. But uh, what I'm going to show you is these are really great uh, instant read thermometers, yeah. and you can calibrate you can calibrate those thermometers and make sure they're working properly. But you want yeah. the chicken to be. 165 when it's done. So I'm just going to pierce that into the center. You don't want to push it all the way through because it'll give you a, a bad read, but I'm uh, at about 125 right now. So if you just check it, you want to make sure that this uh, reads 165 if you want to completely cook through. I personally would pull it at 160 and let it sit for about five minutes and then it, it'll carry up to the 165. But if you want to make sure it's well done, you can even bring it to 170 um, and it should be fine. But this needs a little bit more time. But these are really great instant read uh, thermometers. And they're also wonderful for baking. So if you stick them in your challah and they come to like 180, 190 degrees, then your challah is done. You don't have to like pick it up and tap it. Um, then we have an herb question about growing herbs. I actually do grow my own herbs. I also micro grow microgreens and um, we're very big. Um, here are some of these are here's some of them today too. <laughs> I know I grabbed some off at his house. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. Huh? So I, we do it because I'm not I, sure if you're looking which camera now, but huh? I, yeah. Yeah. The um yeah I got some here too. I piled them. So you know I I, I we this has saved us during the pandemic where we sprout. We always have something um, fresh. Uh, the name of the thermometer. It's just. You know, it's like any, you can, uh, it can use any thermometer. You can get like a $7 thermometer at the grocery store. It's fine. I mean, they're all different ones. I'm going to show uh, on the main screen here, but you know, this is another instant read, but it's uh, digital. And this one, you just need batteries, whereas the other one you don't. So um, if you just go to say William Sonoma, or you go to, you know, any culinary store, you can go online and order them. Uh, they're just these great instant read thermometers. So, yeah, mine's, mine's and then this I the no, I have like a little the, one. Uh, the little microgreens I use to have lentil in them, and you know, I would say with this rice, it, it's really great with the turmeric because uh, you know, if I think of Indian cooking, turmeric is such a a big part of that. And when you think of lentils making the dal, you know, these would be a great garnish for say, you know, lentils and um and having zucchini with the with these greens on them too would be great so any other questions um all of the recipes will be shared at the um end of the video of, of this chat yes yes yeah that's right uh, and i'm gonna pull the finished chicken out so you can see it uh When the chicken's all done, I'm gonna use the cutting board camera right here. You can see we've got nice color and I'm just going to garnish that uh, with, you can do, you can use a couple of the, the micro greens if you like. You could also, uh, as I had put some of the thyme in there earlier, uh, you could garnish with some thyme. 
but really have fun with the color and the, you know, and think about the senses as you're cooking. And it really just makes it fun. I, I love making Indian cuisine. And I would tell you that the first time that I did it in my kitchen, uh, I started by sauteing onions. I, I cook dry spices in pans and I use a mortar and pestle and break them down. And the energy you feel from doing that, it's like drinking like five cups of coffee. So use your cooking and use your senses to really enjoy that process. And you'll drink less coffee and you'll actually enjoy, you know, when you sit down to the table, you'll enjoy that eating experience much more because you know what went into that. Doug? Yes. We've got a, I've got a couple of questions. So I should, maybe I'll pile them all on top of each other. Lots okay. Of, a lot, a lot of people want to know what kind of knives you use. A lot of people want to know whether you grow your own herbs. And let's start with those two. And then there's sure. a third one. So I do grow my own herbs during the summer. I don't typically do it in the winter. Um, I have this great pizza oven outside and I usually have my herbs around my pizza oven and I am able to take a pizza out and put, you know, whether it's little basil or, or oregano or different things um, from outside. So I do it in season. I would tell you too, part of the fun of cooking is going to the store and seeing what is in season. And I sort of like the idea of, of growing my herbs in the summer and looking forward to that process. I love this time of year having uh, the citrus fruits and having the pomegranates and uh, having more of the winter vegetables. Um, I love spring for the asparagus and the strawberries. I love summer for the tomatoes and the corn. And if you eat in that way, and if you buy your food in that way, it's much more fun because you really only have so many uh, opportunities to cook with those items throughout the year. So uh, try and cook that way. And first your food will taste so much better, but it's also a fun experience to revisit those ingredients that you've missed uh, since the, the year before. Now, aside from that herb question, what was, oh, my knives, was that another question? Yes, and then also so, so, what, what wine or beer would you drink with this meal that you're preparing? And sure. do you serve this meal in any rest, any of your restaurants? So I don't serve this meal in any of the restaurants, uh, but uh, what I would tell you is I would definitely uh, eat this meal with, with a great beer. I would say a Pilsner would be great. I like a lighter beer uh, for this type of, of meal. I don't like a stout, for instance, which is a really dark um, beer. I would do a Pilsner or I would do an IPA would be really nice. Um, I would also do, um, you know, really a white wine would be great, like a Chardonnay, but I also think uh, Pinot Noir is my favorite, like an Oregon Pinot or Burgundian style uh, would be great with this, uh, these dishes as well. Um, as far as my knives go, I like European style uh, heavy duty knives, and I like a six inch or eight inch chef's knife. Um, I like the heavy uh, weight of a European knife as opposed to more of the Japanese style um, knives. The global knives are really lightweight. Um, I like to feel the knife in my hand and use that weight when I'm cutting and chopping. Um, I think if you're investing in knives, I would get a six or eight inch uh, chef's knife and then I would uh, supplement it with a, a paring knife, but you don't need to spend a lot of money on your paring knife. Spend a lot of money on your, on your chef's knife. Uh, paring knife, you can almost you know, buy the plastic handled ones and and every six months or so, if you replace them, I, I think they're eight to $12 uh, a lot of times, and you can just get a really sharp one. And it's, it's better as a, as a paring knife to just make sure you have a sharp one and it's not as important. I would say the same uh, with your bread knives. If you butcher meat, things like that, I would say a boning knife or a carving knife would also be helpful. But really put your money into a chef's knife, uh, $150. Uh, to $200 uh, would buy you a great chef's knife. So I think that's more important. And, and then I would tell you, have a good sharpener. Um, this sharpener that I have here is, you know, liter it's probably $8 and you can buy them at Dean Supply. And they just have these uh, little V cut blades and you can just uh, run your knife using that and it sharpens it really nicely. I would be careful sending your knives out to be sharpened, I think. 
uh, you got to care for it uh, and just be careful. I wouldn't run it in the dishwasher. I would, you know, wash it uh, by hand. So just consider it one of your tools that you want to really take care of. Any um, other questions? Yeah, um, a lot of people are asking whether this is recorded. Yes, it is recorded. And after the presentation, we're going to email the recipes um, and I believe a link for the recording. Um, and it'll, or maybe it'll be put up on the website, but it will definitely be available. There was a question about the different kinds of different spatulas that you like to use. And I, I guess it depends sure. on what kind of pan you're using and what you're cooking. They well, I get the whole question disappear, but it was something about eggs. Is it best to show uh, with the, with the uh, camera in front or is that because I can show you close up on the cutting board camera too, if you like. Any, I'll, well, I'll sort of show them both. So these, these are tongs and I think that that's the tool that I like most in the kitchen. I would buy yourself a really nice uh, set of, you know, a tong and I would say they don't have to be super long. You just, they're just really great for flipping things and turning things. Um, I would tell you as far as spatulas and, um, you know, I have all different ones. I have, you know, this is called a fish spatula and I love using this. Uh, it's really super thin. Um, it's not so great with pancakes because it gets stuck, but I would use something like this for pancakes. So I use all different ones. I like the ones that uh, hold up with high, t I, you know, with high temperature. So these uh, red handle uh, rubber spatulas are great for high temp uh, cooking and they don't melt when you use them. Uh, I love wooden spoons as well. Like when I'm using the enamelware cookware, I like to use a wooden spoon, uh, but I do use these tongs most often, I would say. Great. Um, there was a, um, 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 question about chicken breast instead of chicken thigh. Oh, so I like the moist uh, tenderness of the chicken thigh. Um, I like um, the skin and I like the flavor if I'm putting chilies on it or if I'm putting, uh, you know, any flavor on, I love that skin. If you want, if you don't, don't want that and you like more of a, you know, if you like chicken breast, I would, you could certainly do boneless skinless chicken breast and season it and put the uh, paprika on the chicken breast and do the exact same method. Uh, you could also buy a French, uh, they call it French because it has the little wing bone that's clean. Um, you could buy that with the skin on and pan sear it and then take the skin off and it'll keep it a little more moist. Uh, but I just personally like the chicken thighs uh, best and I certainly like it with the rice and with the zucchini. It all sort of just eats well together. Um, but certainly you could use chicken breast if you prefer. Um, there is a question about misfit vegetables and organic vegetables. Um, what do you, what do you want to share with us about misfit vegetables and where do you like to buy your organic vegetables? So I think maybe, uh, I know them as imperfect produce, uh, when I think of misfit vegetables, if you're talking about vegetables that are just not as beautiful and they're maybe, you know, it's like a, a zucchini squash could be maybe angled or they don't look the most beautiful. Uh, personally, I'm one of those chefs. I love to go into my refrigerator and see what's left. And I like to cook that way. So. I love, you know, the idea of using vegetables that maybe are, you know, don't look so perfect. And, um, but I think it really depends on what vegetable that is. If I'm thinking of one in particular that, you know, I think most people would consider a misfit would be a, like to say a rutabaga that, you know, they just look sort of like misfit vegetables. And I love those and you peel them and dice them and you can saute them. That would be great actually with turmeric and onions and uh, slowly roasted or making a soup. Uh, I think the misfit vegetables, I would also say are great for soups, uh, pureed soups that you, you really won't see those vegetables uh, if I'm understanding the term properly. And organics, I really don't, um, I buy organic berries and things, but I don't think you have to buy uh, like organic, uh, there's a list of vegetables that are important to buy that are organic and I would look those up, but I don't think you need to buy everything organic and if you go to the store these days it seems like 
you can only buy organic things. And, and I'm not sure that it really matters uh, for a lot of these things. It's really just a way to mark up the, the pricing of a lot of these products by saying that they're organic. Uh, and it just doesn't matter in many cases, I would say. Yeah, and a lot of these fruits and vegetables are grown hydroponically indoors. It's, it's, it's a whole different process. And that's, I actually, grow my herbs and lettuce year round in a hydroponic garden that we have in our basement. So um, mm -hmm. it's really, it's really fun. It, it's, it's fun to do. And it makes you like you were talking about when you threw your herbs in, when you're making the Indian food, it just, it feels really good. You feel good when you. And I would tell you too, like I compost and we have a service that picks up at our house, but it, it again, you know, Using your senses is one thing, but feeling good about what you do and, and how you cook and having sort of a clean uh, kitchen and cleaning as you go and, and sort of enjoying that process. I think for me, uh, not throwing all of my scraps away and being able to put them in a compost bin and having someone pick them up and taking them to a farm. And I know that, you know, I purchase from farms that use the compost that this company picks up for me. So it's a really nice cyclical relationship. I know that I'm going to be buying vegetables in the spring or summer that use the compost that I'm uh, providing for them. So it's really nice to connect with the community in that way as well and makes you feel that much better. Um, uh, we need to start moving on. There were some quick, there, I, I, instead of giving you the answer to I've got a couple of questions. It'll just be faster if I answer them right away. There's a difference sure. between sprouting and microgreens. Microgreens are actually the green, like it's actually the plant and it's very full because it's so young. It's full with tons and tons of nutrients. Sprouting is only the sprout and you, do, you don't even need a light to do this. They just, you, you just need a dark spot and you put seeds into a glass jar and you rinse them and a few days later you will have your sprouts and that's like the bean sprout and that you see but when you see them like tall that's a those are a micro greens and then there was another question about grass fed beef um i highly recommend with my clients who have health issues um i only give them the the um uh, a very little grass fed beef i'm we're not big i'm not a big proponent of a lot of animal protein. What's your answer on that? And then we're going to move on. I would tell you that if you can buy great grass fed beef, you should, and that's the best quality and that's the best for your body and for your health. It's hard to find good quality grass fed beef that uh, isn't tough and that's, you know, hard to eat. I, I do um, see it in the store, but I love buying from a local farm called Miller grass fed. And if oh. you're ever interested in that, they do uh, three, three, uh, actually every three weeks, they bring grass fed beef uh, to Cleveland, the Cleveland area. It is not kosher uh, meat, but it's really great quality. And uh, all of our burger meat is from them. And there's another farm that I can connect you with as well. But I, I really think grass-fed beef and uh, just pasture-raised um, mm -hmm. meat is, is the way to go health-wise. Great. And I am getting, my phone is beeping. We, I need to say thank you to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you. Stay right there because you're going to show off your food in a second. So, all right. Thank you, Doug, for the great demonstration and the conversation. Like we've seen today, how appreciative cooking can nourish you and those you love in many ways. So, can volunteering and giving back to the community, especially when it means helping to provide nourishment to those experiencing food insecurity. When the pandemic hit, our community volunteers, partners, and agencies stepped up in a tremendous way. Day schools began a kosher meal distribution program for families who relied on daily breakfast and lunch for their kids. Jewish community food pantries pivoted to new safe drive-through models and scaled up to meet Passover and other ongoing needs. And throughout the past year, the need has been especially profound for our community seniors. Older adults who, re older adults who relied on their weekly congregate meals and socializing socialization programs regular access to grocery stores and meals with family were newly homebound and more in need than ever. I would like to introduce to you, Maria Lee and Brian, two special people who derive great joy by volunteering with Jewish Federation funded agents, organizations. 
which combat food insecurity and the stresses associated with it. So the Westside Food Co-op is an initiative that started actually around PESA time, right at the beginning of the pandemic. That was like the beginning of the rumors where we start hearing the pulse of the community that food insecurity was going to be a massive issue to deal during this pandemic. We go out of our way to make sure everybody's need is fulfilled without being invasive in what the privacy of the family is. And we try to integrate a lot of other agencies and services into the Food Co-op. This community was not going to let each other go hungry. This community was going to take care of each other one way or the other. That's who we are. I live with the gratitude to know that I have a community behind me that have showcased over and over how we show up for each other in really innovative ways. I'm really proud of being able to do this, being able to be in, in between this amazing group of people that just go out their way. And I feel I'll, that that will produce a lot of autonomy and a lot of ownership and pride in Jewish living in the West Side. And the Hexa Center has the big infrastructure. And I hope that we get like an example of how much better we are when we work together. The Cleveland Chesed Center is an organization that was started by Rabbi Adler and Mrs. Friedman to address a larger segment of the community that I think we'd want to admit that has food insecurity issues. Getting enough food on the table to feed their households, but also helping them with clothing and other necessities as well. The Chesed Center serves the greater Jewish community, so it's not just the east side of Cleveland, it's Jews in Lorraine, Jews in Medina, anywhere where it's practical to reach, the Chesed Center avails itself to those people in those communities so that no Jewish family should go unserved. Obviously with social distancing and the spread of COVID, the Chesed Center had to quickly mobilize to becoming a drive-through service. And no matter what the weather is, whether it's the Passover drive, the Chesed Center has really adapted to meet the needs of the community and pack cars as they drive through the parking lot at the Chesed Center and make sure that families still get the staple items they need to take care of their families and have the minimum basic needs for Shabbos and Yantav. Chesed starts with our neighbors. Chesed starts with our community and the Chesed Center is making sure that our community is being taken care of. Thank you so much for that. Warms my heart to see how our community deals with these needs with dignity and respect. If you or someone you care about is having trouble coping, please call Access Jewish Cleveland to be connected to resources. If you know of someone is having trouble putting food on the table, please refer them to Access Jewish Cleveland, the Chesed Center, or the West Side Food Co-op. These are free and confidential resources and referral services for the Jewish community. Now we're gonna go back and see the plated food. So yeah, that's well, thank you. the finished dish, and then you can see the nice yellow color. And it really tastes delicious too. That's not fair. But yeah. that's just mean. <laughs> You're mean. I could bring you some. I could describe it. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, stay. Thank on. you so much. Yeah, there, there, we we may. I'm looking at the time. We may have a minute for additional okay. questions. Um, would you mind staying on? Not at all. Okay. Maybe I'll so, take a bite and see how it tastes. That oh mean? gosh, yeah. I'm sorry, but that's just mean. Okay, so finally, please join us for the additional programs in this series. This Wednesday, February 17th at five o'clock for the COVID-19 vaccine and you get the facts with Dr. Robert Wiley, Chief of Medical Operations at the Cleveland Clinic and Dr. Stephen Gordon, Chair of Infectious Disease at the Cleveland Clinic. Next Monday, February 22nd at seven o'clock, please join us for Finding Calm During Chaos with Lori Wald and Yoshi Silverstein, hosted by Scott Simon. And then on Monday, March 15th at seven, when we present Finding Spiritual Resilience in a year, a year into COVID-19. 
Um, that's with Rabbi Melinda Mersak and Rabbi Benjamin Blau. Um, I am going to say thank you to everybody, but I think we have a couple of minutes. It's 5.52. So we have a couple of minutes if anybody has any questions. Anybody out there? One thing I would tell you if we're waiting on questions is, uh, as I was mentioning earlier too, as a chef, I think one of the drivers for me is going to the local farmer's market or going to the grocery store that I really like or, or going to the spice shop that I really like and connecting with people throughout the process. Uh, I think health is really about your mindset. And I think as you make the process something that sort of is fun in your life and you can experience all different aspects of, of uh, cooking, whether it's the shopping part or whether it's the cutting or the there's a Zen aspect too, where you're in the kitchen and you're just working on your knife skills and, and you're having fun doing that. Uh, so really whatever excites you about the process, try and find those elements and, and use those to enhance your cooking and enhance your health uh, and your positive ad attitude in general. Yeah, I totally agree with you. People often ask me what to eat. And um, sometimes I just tell them what not to eat. And when you eat, just eat happy food, eat food that makes you feel good. And uh, I think you're right when you say happy food. I think a lot of times you can't just buy, you know, you got to buy food that looks great to you. And that is something that, you know, you want to nurture your body. And so it should be happy food. Don't buy food that is, you know, sitting off to the side on the discount shelf. And, you know, it, it's going to taste you know, the quality of the food you buy is what you're going to end up making in your recipe. So really, if you're going to cook, go all in and nurture the ingredients and nurture your body and, and do it right. So we've got one final question that we're going to go out on. Um, yep. People are asking about the status of your restaurants and what's going on. So we are actually uh, hoping to relaunch Zoog as a, as a, um, in dining experience in late April, we're hoping uh, that we can do that. And then we hope to launch Amba, which is an Indian restaurant or an Indian uh, uh, fusion sort of concept and Chimney, which is a South American concept. We're hoping to find locations for those and open those as well as brick and mortar restaurants. Uh, really, we're taking one day at a time and we're nurturing the staff that we still have um, working with us and we're just uh, looking in the at the rebuild now i would say in the last two weeks we're now talking about our future and what is possible so we're really looking forward to that and uh i'll certainly share with you as, as uh whenever i know wonderful thank you so much thank um, you I'm, in the comments people really have enjoyed this and we're getting a ton oh. of thank yous and it's really it's fun to watch. I've got the privilege of being able to read these. Uh, <laughs> it's really, it's, it's really actually quite fun. Well, I get to, I get to eat. So that's, that's that. Oh, see. <laughs> again. <laughs> well, thanks a lot. We're looking forward to all your restaurants opening. Thank you. Have a good night. Everybody stay warm and be safe.